this weekend, the latest film in the wizarding world, Fantastic Beasts, The Secret of Dumbledore, has dropped in theaters. So today we're gonna stop and rank all 11 films in the wizarding world from the worst to the best. Hi, my name is Sean and I started this channel because I was driving everyone around me crazy talking about movies way too much. If you can relate, you're probably in the right place and consider clicking that subscribe button. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of all the movies in the wizarding world. My list isn't the right list, it's just my list and I would love to see yours. And to be clear, I am ranking them only based off how they work as movies, not based off of the books. I've read the first three books, but I haven't read the rest of them, so I can only evaluate them as films. With that said, let's get started. In last place, Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald. This movie really highlights the central problem of the Fantastic Beasts franchise, which is it can't decide if it's about quirky Newt and his Fantastic Beasts or about the epic battle trying to stop Grindelwald. And because of that, it feels like the first movie didn't set up a set of heroes and villains that fit the story that they're telling. The first movie did not set up Credence to be this interesting, dynamic character that's at the core of the Dumbledore mythology. Newt isn't interested in being this hero that's in the middle of all this politics. He just wants to be off with all of his creatures, but that's the character they set up to be the lead in an epic battle between a bunch of wizards and you just feel that tension all throughout this entire film. Adding to that, this is a movie that doesn't really have a strong central plot line, but it gives every single character their own subplot with in-depth backstories and nuances. And so it just feels like we're jumping from character to character, hearing all about everything that brought them to this point in time. and because so many of them are set up to be red herrings rather than actual meaningful meaningful plot development, by the time you get to the end of it, you don't even know what matters, why it matters, and when you get the final reveal about Credence, it rings kind of hollow. Add to that, some of the choices characters make feel like they came totally out of nowhere, and Johnny Depp feels horribly miscast because you do not believe for one second that this version of Grindelwald would be in this deep, intimate relationship with Jude Law's Dumbledore. When you put it all together, it's fun that we get to spend time in the wizarding world in Europe, but beyond that, it's a movie that just rings hollow and has too many ideas that are not properly explored. Number 10, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Once again, I haven't read the book. I'm evaluating it purely on the movie itself. And this adaptation of the Pen Ultimate book, to me, felt like a meandering information dump instead of a proper setup for the finale. There's all sorts of subplots and backstories, and we learn a bunch of information, but it doesn't have a strong plot line throughout the entire film. Even the mystery of the Half-Blood Prince feels a little bit tacked on at the end of the film. There's also just a lot of events that happen in the film that that are touched on, but they're not explored. And I assume a lot of what's going on here is there's only so much you can do adapting a 600 page book into a two hour and 20 minute movie. And some of the nuances, some of the details got lost. And for me, as someone that hasn't read the book, that meant I was a little bit lost while watching this film. Also, the absence of Voldemort in this film, this late in the game where we're right before the epic finale, just strikes me as an odd choice at a point in time where you want the main villain to be very present, creating this sense of danger and urgency. He has such a small part in the film, and I think that just kind of weakens the sense of danger that you should feel in a movie that's this bleak. Now, they took some creative liberties and chances and risks with the look of the film, and for me, they didn't pay off. It just looks so desaturated and drab. I know that that's intentional. They're trying to show the decline of the world and how dark things are getting, but it makes for like an ugly film to look at at certain points in time. And so while there's moments, there's elements that are interesting. I can see where there could be a great story in here if it could, got properly explored and fleshed out. But as is, as someone that didn't read the book, it was unfocused, it was too grim, and it lacked the fun or weight of some of the other films. Next up, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1. 
feel like this movie got the short end of the stick here because inherently when you take a book, split it in half, make it into two movies, the first half is going to feel like you're just moving all of the pieces in place, setting up all the exciting payoff, and then your movie ends. And that's exactly what this movie feels like. It's this drab, bleak movie about our characters wandering around trying to get things with no resolution at the end, no payoff, no proper climax. And it's not that it doesn't have some great moments in it. There's some a great chase at the beginning of the film. There's some sweet moments between the characters where you have Harry and Hermione dancing, just showing how much they care about one another. When Dobby dies, it is an absolute punch in the gut. But the main body of the story just feels a little bit like we're meandering around trying to find these horcruxes and failing and getting lost and having disappointment, which is what's happening in the story. That's kind of the point. But without it leading to something in this movie in and of itself, it's not a very satisfying film experience in and of itself. That's the inherent problem with splitting a story in half that's not designed to have a middle midpoint break that doesn't have a midpoint climax that feels like you can be like, yeah, that works right there. And then we'll pick up with the next one. I feel like all of this material would have played much better if it was the first 90 minutes of a three hours Deathly Hollows film as a movie in and of itself. It's, it's a bit of a drag. Number eight, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. This introduction to the prequel franchise sets up an enjoyable new set of characters who are very different from the characters we found in the Harry Potter films, but puts them in a new context we get to explore the wizarding world in an all new way. Newt Scamander is such a quirky, weird character, but has this unique likability about him. He's so naive and gentle in this one sense while dealing with these crazy wild creatures that he has a very endearing quality to him and he has great chemistry with the characters that he's matched with. Add to that, there's just a fun, whimsical nature to the central adventure about him trying to capture these creatures that have escaped in New York City in the past that just gives us this new perspective on the Wizarding World. Unfortunately, at the core of the Fantastic Beasts franchise is an identity crisis, and it can't decide if it wants to be out Newt Scamander and tell stories that have the same tone and energy of the first few Harry Potter films, or if it wants to be this epic tale about catching Grindelwald that has the tone and vibe of the later Harry Potter films, and instead it mashes them together. So you have these quirky sequences with Newt capturing animals, followed by Credence being abused. That escalated quickly. And they just don't go together. And you have Newt getting a death sentence over a small mistake. And so there's all these wonderful fun sequences and then other ones that just suck the fun out of the movie. And it's frustrating when you can see how if you just split the franchise in two, make it two different franchises for two different audiences in the Wizarding World, it would have worked better. Add to that, the movie ends with like a Scooby-Doo ending where they take the mask off to reveal who Grindelwald really is and these characters, but the movie was never a whodunit. And so once again, it's just a movie that couldn't decide what it wanted to do, what it was trying to do. So there's a bunch of great new characters. There's stuff I love about it. And then it also sabotages itself at the same time. Then we have Fantastic Beasts, The Secrets of Dumbledore. For me, this is easily the most focused and tonally consistent of the Fantastic Beast films. And I think a big part of that is that they brought in Stephen Cloves to work with J.K. Rowling on the script. He was the person that had adapted all but one of the Harry Potter films, and he got to work with J.K. Rowling to craft this film. And for me, it's the most focused on the central plot line that's most tonally consistent and decided what it was going to be from the onset. Beyond that, the movie plays a little bit like a political spy thriller set in the wizarding world, which is just an interesting new direction to take this franchise that I actually really appreciated all kind of the espionage aspects, diving into the politics of the wizarding world in the lead up to World War II. 
I just found all of it very interesting. Also, Phil, Mads Mikkelsen is a much better Grindelwald that you can believe that this guy at one point in time, him and Jude Law's Dumbledore had this deep, intimate relationship that at some point in time split as their worldviews went in very different directions. And despite that love for one another, they are at odds forever and in battle. Along the way, you get some great solid little goofy laughs in there. You get some great wizard battles. So I don't think it really captures the magic of the peak Harry Potter films, but I thought it was a nice return to form, a nice addition to the Wizarding World in a film that I did enjoy. Number six, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Fun fact, this movie was my introduction to the Wizarding World. I hadn't seen the first film, I hadn't read any of the books, and a girl took me to go see this movie, and so thus I was introduced to Harry Potter with this film. So for me, I feel like this movie has a clearer plot and mystery than the previous film. The first one did all kind of the laid the groundwork, established the world, and that meant at the beginning of this one, it was able to establish the mystery, the threat very early on. Adding to that, it gives us a bunch of backstory about Tom Riddle becomes Voldemort, kind of fleshing out who this threat is and how did he become the Dark Lord. And the other thing you just have to talk about with this movie is that it introduces three great side characters, Dobby, Lucius Malfoy, and Gilderoy Lockhart. All three of them steal every single scene in their end, whether it's just being sinister or adding levity into the story. All of them are great. And for me, Dobby, I think, gets some of the best laughs in the entire franchise. Dobby had to iron his hands. Now where this one for me struggles a little bit is that they took the shortest book and made the longest movie out of it. And just inherently when you do that and you don't adapt the book, you just translate it page for page over into a movie. It's just a little bit long for the amount of material that they had and the tone and the vibe that they were going for. So it can drag a little bit, meander a little bit, but still, of kind of those early films, there's something fun about just exploring Hogwarts with our trio. Kicking off our top five, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. This is the movie in the franchise where I feel like I have the most complex relationship with it, where every time I watch it, I kind of come to a different conclusion as to how I feel about it. For whatever reason, in my last ranking that you did of these movies, I guess I watched it in a bad mood and had it like way at the bottom of the list. Watched it this time, and I found a lot more to enjoy about the film. I think a big part of kind of my conflicting feelings about it is that very much at the core of the story is that our cute little kids are growing into adults and they're in that awkward middle phase where they're figuring out their emotions. They've got a lot of angst inside of them, a lot of big gigantic emotions. And so depending on how much I'm in the mood for that sort of thing, I can land very differently on it. It also tells a very different story from the previous three films that were kind of mysteries all set at Hogwarts exploring things. This one's about a tournament that drives the fo story forward in a different type of way, all leading up to a finale where finally Voldemort reveals himself as a physical threat once again, and the stakes dramatically rise as soon as that happened because a kid Batman himself literally gets killed in these tournaments, just taking everything to an entirely new level. So this one, I don't think has ever been one of my favorites. I know a lot of people really love this one. I think there's a lot of cool stuff in here. Some stuff that I go back and forth on, but a lot of really important things in the development of our characters. Number four, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone or Philosopher's Stone, depending on where you watch the film. Now, this movie is just a great kick off to the wizarding world by introducing us to a fun, enjoyable, interesting set of characters and doing just some phenomenal world building that creates this place that you want to go and explore and learn more about. Add to that, we have this central little boy character who's sent on this hero's journey where he starts off as this orphan being raised by his abusive aunt and uncle, only to discover that he's in fact a legendary wizard. Now the real piece of magic here is that they were able to cast the right 
10 year olds to carry this franchise for the next 10 years and eight films. The casting here was really quite phenomenal, whether you're talking about those unknown children or filling out all of the side roles, even background characters with great actors where you have like nearly headness Nick is played by the incredible John Cleese. But the thing here that really pulls it together is J.K. Rowling created such a amazing world filled with small little details where you care about the design of everything and the rules of everything. And despite the fact that she doesn't understand how games work, because the rules of Quidditch make absolutely no sense, since she otherwise created this marvelous world that just draws you in. Now, some of the special effects haven't aged the best over the last 20 years, and there's a couple of moments with the child actors that aren't quite up to their usual standards. No, you've made a mistake. I mean, I can't be a, a, a wizard. But none of that really matters too much, because this movie is all about exploring this fun world. Even the central plot line about the philosopher or sorcerer's stone is a little bit of an afterthought in the film because this is about meeting our characters, learning about the world, and exploring Hogwarts. And that works in and of itself. Real quick, before I give you my final thoughts, be sure to join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of the films in the wizarding world. My list isn't the right list. It's just my list, and I would love to see yours. And as I keep reminding you, I haven't read the books. I'm just ranking them based off my experience watching the films. Also, if you enjoyed this video, I've done a ton of rankings just like this one of all the other big major film franchises. You can check that out right up here for more rankings rankings just like this one. In third place, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. The third trip to Hogwarts brings in a new director who tells one of the best and most focused stories. On a personal note, I'm always a sucker for time travel stories, so when you have a story that ties time travel in very heavily into what happens, where you have characters reliving events in the film through a second time from a different perspective, I always love that stuff, so inherently this movie was just catering to my taste in films. But beyond that, I feel like this was also just a much more focused narrative. The first couple films felt a bit like a series of kind of episodes at Hogwarts across the school year with a narrative sort of tying them together, whereas this one from the very beginning, it establishes the threat, the mystery, the thing we're trying to figure out. And all throughout the film, our characters are making choices in the direction trying to solve that, which is what makes for a solid, good story. Add to that, once again, we get some new, wonderful side characters, in particular Sirius Black, played by... Uh, Gary Oldman, but the real magic here is Alfonso Cuaron, the director. I thought Chris Columbus just brought a great vibrance to the world, a childish energy, but Alfonso Cuaron brought in an artistic flair that made for one of the most interesting looking of the Harry Potter films. It's got a great story, it's told with top-notch storytelling, and it has an interesting look to everything. Put it all together, you get one of the best films in the franchise. Our runner-up, Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. When it comes to the story itself, this might be my personal favorite. Throughout this entire franchise, I've always wanted Harry to fully step into that leadership role that they've constantly been alluding to throughout all of the films. And finally, with the looming danger and people not believing him, that's exactly what he does. Forms this Dumbledore's army, starts training fellow students, and you just feel that the defense fits the looming threat that they've been talking about since the very first film. Add to that, they establish a fantastic villain in Dolores Umbridge very early on in the film. And so she's one of these characters that you just love to hate. She's not the physical threat, but she does have power and she's just despicable. And so when she finally gets what's coming to her and the twins start messing with her and all that fun stuff, it is just so 
satisfying. Also, it builds to this great finale where you finally start to see wizards in action with real stakes, real wizard adventure stuff taking place. Not just kids at a castle, but actual war with wands, all of that fun stuff that they've been alluding to all along. And that's why this one I enjoy so much because it's what I have been waiting for since the beginning of the franchise. All of that said, it's also probably the film where you can feel them condensing things the most. I think they did a good job of doing kind of this Cliff Notes version of the story, but it's very clear that they're taking this and going and squeezing it into the runtime of a film. And had they been able to tell the story properly, if you did it as like a season of television, this one probably would have been my favorite. But coming in in first place, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part Two. Whereas part one was plagued by being a setup film, part two benefits from being 100% a payoff film. Everything in this movie from beginning to end is the payoff of everything that was set up in the previous film, as well as the previous six films before that. And it just makes for a very emotionally satisfying end to the Harry Potter saga. Likewise, I think one of the things that sometimes the Harry Potter movies struggle with a little bit is that because they're covering a full school year, they meander a little bit. You don't have this sense of urgency and danger because it's kids at school for a whole year investigating different things. But with this one, because it's just the back half of a story that takes place in a very short period of time, it can keep up that sense of tension and danger from beginning to end and is able to focus all of that energy that makes for a big, exciting finale. Throughout all the course of the previous films, it set up this tension between Harry Potter and Voldemort, and we get that showdown in this film. The stakes are massive, the destruction is huge, the battle lasts for well over an hour in the film, and even before that, you had big, gigantic action sequences. And so as much as it built up this finale, it lives up to the hype with the emotions, the action, the spectacle, all of it. But it's not just Harry that gets the big moments. Neville, the doofus from the first movie, turns out to be this massive hero that gives an epic speech. I didn't die in vain, but you will, because you're wrong. And is so pivotal in defeating Voldemort. It's not just action, it's also emotion as there's tragic death, there's twists, turns, reveals that all pay off properly and they all feel earned. All of the things that you want in the final episode of your saga are present in this film. It closes out the plot lines, it has big emotion, it has the biggest spectacle, and it feels like it properly lands the ship in an earned way. So for me, as someone that absolutely loves payoff and emotionally resonant, resonant conclusions, it comes in at number one. If you enjoyed this video, I've got more rankings just like this one. You can check them out right over there, all the big gigantic franchises. Also, I did a series where I did review each of the Harry Potter films. You can check those out down there. They're older videos, so my opinions have changed a little bit, but if you want more, more in-depth thoughts, they are right over there. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies too much.